get on board the Bernier bus stream. Come get on board the Bernier bus stream. Once you hear that clickety clack, there ain't no time for turning back. Come get on board the Bernier bus train. Good morning, USA, and welcome to another episode of the Bernie or Bust Show. Sanders calls out Warren's terrible Medicare for All plan. Yes, he does. Bernie Sanders takes the gloves off and calls a spade a spade. Hundred dollars now, and it's mandated. And if you make, I don't know, two hundred thousand dollars, you're paying. $9,500. So if you are a rich person, Warren's plan is much better for you. And I don't know exactly where the, the cutoff is, where they kind of uh, cross each other. Um, but basically, if you're not making a lot of money, Warren's going to take half your paycheck in a nutshell. So That's one look. Here is Another look, not at the uh, health care plan. We're going to skip around a little bit. What we're trying to show is that the health care plan is part of a larger problem, which is uh, kind of a tone deafness, kind of a lack of empathy and sympathy and compassion for working class people. And not just Elizabeth Warren's lack of sympathy, but clear back. To, we'll be talking about Bill Clinton today. We'll be talking about how he favored what he calls the middle class over labor, which is like putting people in the same, putting the same people against each other. It's a, it's a disingenuous and tricky way to make markets more important than individual human beings. But that's all coming. But th l listen to um, Kyle here. He is trying to say why Bernie has an edge over Elizabeth that we'll find is a pattern. It's, it's that lack of of empathy that Elizabeth has for working class people that Bernie has in spades. And you can see it, we're, we're talking a lot about polls today. So you'll see in the polls how um, that that plays out with Elizabeth Warren's voter base versus Bernie Sanders voter base, which don't overlap very much. Quinnipiac has an interesting new poll that I want to share with you. This is a little gem that's hidden in there. But I think it's like, it might be low-key one of the most important factors in this election. This is uh, Kevin Robillard, Robillard uh, tweeted this. This is from that poll. Sanders has a massive lead in voter enthusiasm. 52% of Sanders voters are extremely excited to vote for him. Extremely excited. Uh Buttigieg is 31% are excited to vote for him. Warren, only 23% are excited to vote for him. Biden, only 19% are excited to vote for him. By the way, that proves my case on Biden, that uh, Biden has default support. Yeah. And then he says 61% of Sanders voters say they're definitely voting for him. 61%. For Biden, it's only 48. Warren, 44. Pete, 40. Guys, this is huge. It's huge because that enthusiasm is what drives elections, what really wins elections. Politics 101 is you got to turn out your base. Bernie Sanders turns out his base way more than anybody else in this election. And you know who else turns out their base? Donald Trump. So think about that. You got this guy who has hardcore supporters, highest approval rating in his own party of any president. Trump has. You have to counter that with somebody who has massive enthusiasm behind him and that's bernie sanders i went to that poll it was difficult to dig down into those numbers and see what he was talking about if candidate chosen who's your second choice that that's hard to to get i i've been trying to get emerson polling to back up the idea that 26 percent of sanders voters would rather vote for trump than than for warren they're cagey now. The guy that runs the Emerson polling, the professor there, isn't isn't returning calls or answering emails. I think I think that was a major piece of information that uh, wasn't supposed to get out. That's my my look at it. I think that the that the traditional liberals 
don't don't like the idea that Sanders support is is so willing to be populist rather than wonky. But anyway, he's right. Kyle is right that um, the if you look at this poll, it's I finally found it. It is a Quinn. Quinnipiac, however you say it. Quinnipiac, yes, I know how to say it. There's a guy on uh, Facebook who was saying, who was mad at me for pronouncing Yemen incorrectly. And I said it was because I don't watch enough corporate news. And that's why I don't always know how to say say words that, that people who follow politics, I'm I'm newer into politics than than some people that, that know the right words. But Quinnipiac and Yemen are words apparently that signal people that that you don't know what the hell you're talking about. But I do. I've been paying attention more than a lot of people. And when I when I went to this poll and I did the search, I said extremely excited. I found are you extremely excited, very excited, mildly mildly excited or not that excited? And there lo and behold, Sanders 52% Biden, 19 percent. Warren, 23 percent. Buttigieg, 31 percent. Extremely excited. And I think Kyle's right. I think that is a when you're looking at the swing states. I'm going to keep moving because we've got more to say about swing states. This guy was on Rising this morning or yesterday afternoon and um, excellent. This political consultant. Warren released her long-awaited official Medicare for All plan. According to the proposal, it would cost roughly $52 trillion over 10 years. Now, critics have wasted no time attacking the plan, including Senate colleague and the former presidential contender Bernie Sanders. Joining us for a deep dive into Warren's plan and how it compares to Senator Sanders' bill is journalist Zed Jelani. Zed, welcome back to the show. Great to see you, sir. So, Zed, I mean, you've you've been uh, tweeting a lot about this. Basically, the the gripe with Elizabeth Warren, uh, her plan, is that, I mean, in my view, and I, I I borrowed some of this from your analysis as well, is that it was basically a workaround having to say middle class taxes are going to go up when everybody knows that if you were going to do it, a payroll tax is basically the most efficient way to do it. So it seems like an electoral ploy. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, every yeah. country in the world that has universal health care does it basically through employer and employee side payroll taxes and employee contributions. Uh, Elizabeth Warren had this year been very big on health care, not really committing to one plan or another, talking about Medicaid buy-in, other things like that. Eventually, she said, I'm with Bernie. I think she kind of backed herself into a corner. Mayor Pete really went after her about costing. And so I think what she did is she told her plan, her team basically, guys, let's put together a plan where I can say it doesn't raise middle class taxes. But, you know, as Matt Brunig and Jared Bernstein, former uh, top econ advisor in the Obama administration, have said, actually it does raise middle class taxes. It right. just does so indirectly. Yeah. Uh, but this is what politicians always do when they say we can't raise taxes. When you demonize taxes, you end up designing other mechanisms that still hit the middle class. It's just not as efficient and simple as just a, norm, a normal yeah. like payroll tax. It's just less transparent. I mean, I saw somebody was saying basically like this was all an effort to trick journalists who aren't that smart or don't understand policy yeah, yeah, that much yeah. into saying that. It what she doesn't say, it isn't just to trick journalists. It's to trick the American people who have been trained by journalists. Uh, the, you know, journalists aren't aren't as stupid as maybe they're saying here. It, it, we're training the American people to knee jerk and not not accept any kind of middle class tax raises, even when they're um, for, we're actually going to save money in the long run with a, a increase in in the Medicare tax. A lot of us who are not 65 yet will suddenly get some some coverage for for a tax we're already paying that we would normally have to wait until we're 65 to get any benefit. So so we're getting a immediate benefit from a slight tax increase and and we're saving money because we don't have the co-pays and deductibles and all that so it's it's very sneaky and and the real really the american people are the ones who are getting duped it doesn't raise middle class taxes and i think from the progressive perspective as well which is something that jared bernstein was also writing about accepting this framework that all taxes are bad is also not a good place to stand oh. Well, let's remember, particularly if you're like a state or a local lawmaker, you can't just like, oh, I'm going to tax Jeff Bezos, right? That your tools that you have at your disposal are like income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes. And if you demonize the idea of just 
basically just raising taxes for people having them contribute a little bit more. You can't raise money for schools. You can't raise money for transit, for transportation, for health care, uh, for child care, for a lot of the basic needs for homeless, for the poor. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is not shifting economic debate, just saying the rich will pay for everything. I mean, that's cheap, like, lowbrow populism to me. Yeah. Really shifting the debate in the United States would be to say, hey, taxes aren't that bad. It's, what, it's the price that we pay for society, for a decent society. Yeah. Contributing a little bit more in taxes and just paying less overall because the system would be more efficient and more fair. I think that makes a lot of sense, and that's what Bernie Sanders is saying. And that's yeah. really – that it's about trust, which is if you're willing to step on that third rail and be like, listen, this is a social contract we're entering. You trust that you by giving – I'm going to raise these taxes. I'm going to deliver you that system. Well, now whether that system works out that way, I mean we can have those debates. But ultimately – I think we need to trust each other more than trust Bernie Sanders or trust Democrats. I, I would say that workers need to learn to trust each other. We need to figure out – that um, if we don't work together, labor, like union people, work together, we're going to be in trouble. Oracle and economic understanding, it's a fantasy trope that covers so much in the American imagination as to be irrelevant. We have a dynamic in the United States where some incredible hoarders of great wealth still want to claim middle-class modesty. And then we have people who, through shame and subjugation because of the cultural ramifications of how ruthless we do capitalism in this country, feel so much ashamed of poverty and working classness that they project themselves onto the middle class. Elizabeth Warren released a detailed plan with some major holes and questions, potentially even some big structural problems, about how to fund Bernie Sanders' bill for Medicare for All. The biggest problem in it, and there's a lot of actually commendable things here, but the biggest problem is the, cho is the choice she made to do a head tax on businesses to provide uh, for a national health system. Tomorrow, we go in depth with Anna Kasparian. That will be premiered tomorrow. But the bottom line is, and this is as reported by Matt Brunick, this is an incredibly regressive move. And in fact, it's a hidden tax. But she chose to do it apparently so as to still have the ability to say that her bill has no middle class tax increases. <clears throat> this, first of all, is an increase in terms of reality and overall cost. And it also feeds on some of her core weaknesses. This is Elizabeth Warren. Explaining why, or not really explaining, look at her, I don't even know how to properly frame this. What is a middle class, according to Elizabeth Warren? This was from over the weekend. Senator, when you say you won't raise middle class taxes, what is the income bracket that you use to define middle uh, Here it's 100%. It doesn't raise taxes on anybody but billionaires. And you know what? The billionaires can afford it, and I don't call them middle class. So billionaire, that's where it worked. Anyone under a billion dollars net worth. That's right. It's not paying a penny more. Not paying a penny more. That's just a blatant lie. Not paying a penny more. I watch this. Every time I watch this again, I've watched it about seven times. It's, it's sick. She, she's trying to hoodwink you. That's exactly right. Senator, what do you say? So I think we can all understand that that's an extraordinarily problematic formulation that can really narrow some of the range of questions we need to have in this country and policies we need to explore, not just about distribution and taxes, but about power. Right. And that is another right. through line here. See, in 1992, Bill Clinton ran a quite populist campaign, and he had a plan that anybody could read in order. It was called People First, Putting People First. And it had detailed policy proposals for a national health insurance system, for middle class tax cuts, for infrastructure spending and stimulus. While he was extremely unclear and evasive on NAFTA, which was, of yeah. course, a direct threat to the working class, ultimately, obviously, he favored NAFTA. In both instances, the rhetoric of middle classness has been elevated over the rhetoric of power and labor. And this does go back again to the fundamental question of how you are framing change and how you are framing your political project. This is a core 
vast difference between Sanders and Warren and also goes right to the heart of whether or not we can even hope to pray to achieve, quote unquote, big structural change. Bill Clinton's campaign argued that it wasn't afraid to take on unions and labor in favor of middle class values. In the face taking on unions and labor in favor of middle class values. He just goes right by that. But that's the problem. That's Elizabeth's problem. We're, we're not empowering the labor force. I haven't ever heard her, her talk about that. She is trying to rein in the assholes at the top without any power to do it. And that's Bill Clinton's problem. That's Obama's problem, Obama's problem. It, it comes back again and again to this elitism that we grubby populists don't really know what's good for us. So, so yeah, we have to signal that, that we, we care about you, but, but we don't actually. And we still want you to be harnessed to the machinery of industry. And we still want you to accept less than you're worth for wages and, and everything else. We don't want you to have what you need to thrive as we, we, but we'll pay lip service to it. We'll signal that maybe we care about you, but we don't actually. If you care, if you see a candidate who cares, that candidate is trying to help labor be powerful enough to demand what is necessary. Because everything else is just signaling, incrementalism, whatever you want to call it. It isn't real. There's a lot of signaling going on right now. He goes on. Let's, let's get a little bit more from him about Bill Clinton. Because if you understand what's going on, with Bill Clinton, you understand a lot, and Obama, then you understand a lot of what's going on right now, what what the oligarchs want you to do and want you to think, and they want to shape your values in this direction. It's a working class coalition, of working class mobilization, a coalition of the PMC, upper middle class voters, and, and around Warren. The, the coalition of the vote around Warren is worryingly similar to the Democratic Party tradition of preferring the middle class to class struggle. This again goes back to the 1970s and the 1980s and the rise of the Atari Democrats. And it's not just the... The rise of the Atari Democrats. In 1980s and 1990s U.S. politics, the phrase Atari Democrat references Democratic legislators who suggested that the support and development of high-tech and related businesses would stimulate the economy and create jobs. These are Democrats. This is trickle-down Democrat version. Most intense expressions of right-wing neoliberalism, like the Bill Clinton 1996 campaign, but even the more populist 1992 one, which emphasized a need to achieve things for people who work hard and play by the rules. Elizabeth Warren talks constantly about how there used to be a way up the economic ladder and things are rigged and things have been taken away from where they used to be and a lot less about a fundamental redistribution of power to labor. Right. And in fact, the system that she points towards idealizing was predicated on the power of labor, not more enlightened regulators and bureaucrats and corporations. And also just the idea that through certain universal programs, we just guarantee a great standard and basic standard of life for all people, regardless of where they're trying to play up the class system of quote-unquote meritocracy. That was brilliant, Michael. That was so well said. How do they keep so there was us, a new poll. How do they keep us in the dark? Poll out. There was a CNN new uh, University of New Hampshire poll, and they found out. Well, here's here's the results. Bernie Sanders is at 21 percent in New Hampshire. Elizabeth Warren's at 18 percent. Oh, that's fantastic! And Joe Biden. <laughs> Joe Biden's at 15 percent. So look at that. Look at that. Good. So uh, Ryan Grimm caught this. Ryan Grimm. Uh, he said CNN has five articles up about its New Hampshire poll that shows Sanders in front, yet none of the articles say that in the headline. The, here's one. Early state primary voters much more undecided than that. What the F? Here's another one. This is historically unprecedented New Hampshire mess. That's what I was 
thinking with the Kyle Kalinske, he's talking about this poll where, where Bernie Sanders supporters are extremely excited to support him. He had to dig to find that. So did I. I had to dig to find it after he found it. It's the the way this stuff is being reported is is not going to they don't want to raise the hopes of the Bernie people because then the gravy train that they're all riding on will go off the tracks. Instead of Bernie's leading, this is what they say. And there's another one. Sanders and Warren sit atop in New Hampshire, but there's no clear front runner. <laughs> Buttigieg in fourth, but a strong fourth. Oh, oh, oh my God. Fourth place is so fucking strong, Jimmy. That's why the Olympics don't give it a medal, because it's so fucking strong. <laughs> God, remember the team in the NFL last year that came in fourth place? The parade they had yeah. it was fucking amazing. It was a strong parade. Oh, such a strong parade. Strong fourth. I love what Cody Johnson says. He says, when Bernie wins, the headline will be, Buttigieg almost wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And guess, oh. so guess what, though? When CNN reported this on their own network... They flipped the numbers for Elizabeth Warren and Bernie. Look, they did it. They said Elizabeth Warren has 21. And oh, wow. can you believe they did that? They did that. Oh, I believe Here, it. And this can guy you says, believe that this, they lied? This hmm. guy said it's getting a little ridiculous already. Iowa poll, Biden and Buttigieg within striking distance of Warren. What about fucking Sanders? They won't ever mention that. Oh, my God. And by the way, and they still have it. All right. They still have the numbers. Yeah, flipped. see, and they're such a good news organization that it presents, it, it, it misrepresents their own poll. <laughs> their own poll, they get it wrong. And that's what we're up against. You're not going to get any enthusiasm. They keep talking about Matt Brunig, so let me show you. He's got a few People's Policy Project articles, and he, if you really want to dig down and figure out the problem with, with the Medicare for All problem with Elizabeth Warren. Um, I, I'd say with Michael Brooks and Matt Brunig and, and that analyst, analyst on the, the Hill with Crystal and Sagar, if you, if you look at their way of looking at this problem, it, it isn't just um, the way it's packaged. It isn't just the way it, it seems to come across. It's coming from a deep-seated systemic difference in the way Warren and Sanders look at power and how to insist on the change that we need. You've got one person signaling, but not really intending to do anything. And you've got another person who absolutely intends to do something. And that's what scares the the traditional liberals. All right, I, I could go on and on. There, there is so much information here about why this new Medicare for all plan is bad, but also what the, my angle is, what does it reveal about Elizabeth Warren that we all need to know and pay attention to? When you're talking to your friends about this, the problem you're going to find is that they don't really understand the problems of Bill Clinton's presidency and Barack Obama's presidency, and even Jimmy Carter's presidency, if we're going to be fair. And so what you look at is this um, systemic neoliberalism that we need to battle. You can look at yesterday's show for that. And Elizabeth Warren is right in the in the middle of it. She's right at the heart of the problem. She's right there connected to all of the previous ways of thinking. Imperialism, not the least of those. And so if you want to actually solve the problems, she's insidious. She's She's worse in a way than somebody like Donald Trump, who's just out there with all of his evil, so you can see it. Neoliberalism is, in my, my estimation, more evil than Donald Trump. Neoliberalism is a greater evil than Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is a neoliberal. He's just a fascistic version. So if you're, if you're trying to solve this problem by voting for the good guys over the bad guys, you're not going to find good guys in the Democratic Party any more than you'll find them in the Republican Party, with very few exceptions. We need to change the Democratic Party and make it into a new kind of party. And the way to do that is to flex the muscle of the labor force. We need to get labor involved. That's the main thing you'll never hear Elizabeth Warren say. 
she's thinking the way Bill Clinton, that it's that labor is the problem that needs to be solved instead of the answer to the problem. So keep thinking about that. Share this Share these ideas with your union friends. Share them with your uh, affluent suburban Democrat friends. Share them with anybody you can because these ideas won't be out there in the in circulation if if people are just watching their favorite pundits on television. It's just not going to happen. So try to get out around the blockade. Keep sharing these ideas. Keep talking it up. We only have a few more months, and you may be annoying people around the your Thanksgiving or holiday tables, you may be annoying people, whatever holiday you celebrate. But but this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We have to talk about this now and otherwise it's too late. Alrighty, I'll see you tomorrow. Keep on burning. Get on board the burning your bus train. Clickety-clack, there ain't no time for turning back. Oh, get on board.